Welcome to Ear Crush, the Friday podcast for people who love listening to great stories. My co-host once again this week is Troy Odie, the owner of Featured Audio, the company that does the vast majority of the post-production work for LMBPN audiobooks. Troy, when you were here last week, you mentioned the word mistakes, and that was something I wanted to start this week's uh, show with. Uh, when, If you're sitting in front, if a, if a narrator is sitting in front of a microphone hour after hour performing a book, they occasionally make mistakes. How do you catch those mistakes, and then how are those mistakes corrected? Well, so there's two ways. If I'm actually physically recording the book with the narrator – uh, we would both be reading along to the script as we're as we're recording, uh, and usually just stop them when I hear the mistake and say, "Oh, hey, I think we got a mistake. Let's go back and fix that sentence." Um, so we'll do that, uh, and then just kind of keep on going. Uh, the other one is when we're proofing, so we'll be uh, you know sitting down with the manuscript after it's already been recorded. Usually, it's been processed, so we're we're hearing what's closest to the retail, what's going to be available for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll just kind of read along, and when we find errors, we, uh, you know, highlight the script, make a little note, uh, and then after the whole book's been proofed, compile all that together, send it off to the narrator, um, and then they'll uh, record the the sentences that we need, send it back, and then uh, we put the sentences in the audio where they where they should go, and make sure everything's uh, still sounding good, and that the the audio matches well and the, the punches don't sound you know don't sound obvious like oh wow they 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 were sound very different that day or like mm -hmm. different recording setup or something just you know just kind of making sure it sounds seamless so the listener you know never knew we even had to go do that and how do you how does that all work um because i'm i'm envisioning i i've got some idea how it works but when i first heard about this process, I envisioned this thing where you'd say, okay, this sentence was wrong, go and fix it. And they, they'd have to then find out exactly where that was or just re-record it or somehow or other there's a lot of cutting and copying, et cetera, et cetera. How does, how does the process technically work? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we, we try to make it as simple for the narrator as possible. So uh, I'll send them an MP3 sample of just the line or if there's multiple you know errors in a sentence or two the, the paragraph i'll just send the mp3 sample and then in a marked manuscript just the highlighted sentence sentences that i need back um so that hopefully they don't have to even go back to the old audio they sent mm -hmm. uh, they can just start just use the samples and the marked manuscript and just give us the sentences they need and then usually with the MP3 sample, we'll give them enough reference uh, so that they know, was this a character voice? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, was there a certain inflection? Um, just so that they can, they can make sure uh, to get the best match that they can. How much do you give them? If, if there's if this is a, a six-word sentence, do you give them just the six-word sentence or are you giving them like a paragraph on either side of that? Uh, for most, uh, you know, experienced narrators, you can usually just give them just the sentence mm -hmm. or like the sentence before and the sentence after. Um, but yeah, usually they don't need much more than to just hear the line, the way they said it. Um, and then they can usually just, just listen to it, hit record, say the line, and then usually they're good. Okay, we had a situation. We all we work together in a Slack group, uh, so the narrators are there, you're there, and it, uh, occasionally I'll see some correspondence between you and the narrators. And one of our narrators, Gabra Zachman, uh, contacted you and said, "I'm recording this week in a studio, and they've got an air conditioner running that's not normally running." And she sent you a sample of the sound and said, "Are you going to be able to take this out?" And I'm in my own mind, I'm thinking, I have no idea how this works or if it can even work when you've got the sound sort of behind the words and you listen to the sample and wrote back and said, yeah, no problem. So how does that work? <laughs> uh, well, uh, luckily we have like some pretty good technology right now um, to de -no use denoise, um, which is basically just a fancy uh, EQ. Um, that 
can listen to a sample of the room tone or the noise and then can uh, EQ it out. Um, so sometimes, like for subtle noises, like uh, 60, uh, 60 hertz uh, ground noise or elect- electrical noise, mm-hmm. stuff like that because it's so low, it's pretty easy to get out. Um, and then like AC noise just because it's like you're kind of hearing the fan in the background a little bit. Uh, mm-hmm. If it's subtle, then the, the, the processing will work uh it is works really well just to get it out um if it's louder then you can start to hear it underneath narration um but for most of these narrators with their uh whisper rooms or studio bricks or whatever kind of iso booth they're in the you know just a little bit of noise is is easy to get out it's not really it's it sometimes can be noticeable when they're narrating but usually if if they have a good uh, a good, you know, quality mic and a, and a, and a hot signal. It's their, their own voice is covering up most of the noise. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. I know yeah. uh, occasionally when I'll record podcasts, my guest will have this noise in the background. It's probably a fan or something and I don't mm-hmm. hear it until later. I, otherwise I'd say, Hey, could you turn the fan off? And I hear it and it's like, man, that's really <laughs> annoying. And, yeah. but I, I have no way of, of getting it out. So whoever's listening just has to tough it out. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of great tools for audio engineers to use to, to clean up audio in a way that's, uh, doesn't do too much destruction to the, to the quality of the audio and can keep things real clean. So if you are working with a talent on an audio book and you're doing it together in a studio, do you, do you have a studio or do you rent studio space? How does how does that work? Because we don't generally do it that way. We generally are we our narrators are working from home and recording and sending you files. Yes, uh, yeah, I have my own recording studio. Um, it's just very very basic, just a little like four by four room to to record a narrator in. Um, yeah, and I have a just you know a, a typical setup for for audiobook recording. And then are you sitting, like, in another room listening to them? Yes. So the narrator's in the booth, and then on the other side of the wall is my my control room, and that's where I have the computer and the microphone microphone preamp and stuff like that. So, yeah, but it's with with the rise of uh, home studios and kind of the cost of, of... getting into that as far as buying all the gear and computers coming coming to like a reasonable amount of money for narrators to afford i'm doing less and less in-house mm. recordings okay well for for those of you listening out there this has been kind of a fun i hope fun two week uh look behind the curtain at how the post-production process works i hope you've enjoyed it uh this week's story is again we've got two stories this week uh the first one is again from from Craig Martell, narrated by Kate Rudd, and it is, and I, I'm not making this title up, this is the actual title, Gene and Fu's Epic Journey to the Cremera, and it's, again, written by Craig Martell and narrated by Kate Rudd. Gene and Fu's Epic Journey to the Crimea. Jean and Fu left Petersburg with a huge bag of food and household items that Jean carried nonchalantly over one shoulder. It weighed twice as much as Fu, but he didn't care. They were going someplace warm, because Fu was cold in Petersburg. The werebear didn't even question the journey. Once Fu said she couldn't get warm, the decision made itself. Jean wasn't sure how to get there. Where is Crimea? Fu asked innocently as they walked. Even though Jean shortened his stride, Fu still skipped and hopped every third step to keep pace. Head south. Hit Black Sea, turn left, find Crimea, Jean replied. She looked at him out of the corner of her eye. I don't know, the big man admitted. Fu smiled and giggled. I think it will be okay, she suggested. Of course, the big man bellowed in his heavy Russian accent. We are together, Evgeny and Fu, Fu and Evgeny, as it shall always be. Fu smiled and tried to adjust her hand. She could only see her wrist. Jean's fingers could wrap around her hand twice, but at least it was warm. Jean was always warm. 
her personal bear rug. She'd been a servant, but no more. Jean saved her from that life. Sometimes she wondered how she deserved the adoration of such a man, but stopped when she realized that those thoughts wasted time. She accepted it without taking it for granted. Jean needed so very little from her. He only wanted to love her. The big man, older than she would ever know, had never been in love. The sparkle in Fu's almond-shaped big brown eyes drew him to her, made him feel different, self-conscious. He worried that he was too big, too gruff for such a delicate flower. She worried that she was too fragile for a man with strength like his. He picked her up and carried her like a child, but she never felt childish. And he was gentle. Why you love me, Jean? She asked in her lilting accent. Because you are my foo, he answered simply, unsure of the question. Jean, Fu said prodding him in the chest with her tiny finger as she relaxed in his arm with her head on his shoulder. You make me feel, Jean started slowly, looking down at the ground as he plodded forward, step after step. I feel everything better. Colors are brighter. Air is cleaner. Birds sing louder. World is better place with Fu in it. I like being in your world, too. You make me feel safe. I never felt safe before I met you. Fu looked away and pointed to the ground. He put her down, adjusted the bag over his shoulder, and they kept walking. South. Always south. The heat came whenever they walked away from the river, bearing down on them. Jean gave Fu all the water, even though his need was greater than hers. And then they ran out somewhere northwest of Moscow as they were trying to skirt the city, looking for a series of lakes. Ruzos, Jean thought they were called. Fu collapsed. Jean's head swirled. He yelled at the sky and screamed at the hard, dead earth. He changed into werebear form and struggled against the greatest enemy he'd ever faced. His love was dying, and there wasn't anything he could do about it. He moved her about with his massive snout until he could drape her over his neck. He grabbed their bag, light because there was no food or water within. Jean started to lope on three legs as he held his unconscious wife in place with one paw, taking care not to dig his claws in. Being in werebear form cleared his head enough to use his heightened senses. Water. He could smell it. He turned in that direction and ran as fast as he dared, Fu bouncing on his neck and shoulders. He knew that she would be bruised and sore, but water was life. Jean saw the green of vegetation, hiding within a dip, a valley through which a stream flowed and where a small lake had formed. Jean slowed to negotiate a bank, jump across a ravine, and plowed into the clear water without hesitation. Fu fell from his neck and sank below the surface. A human Jean swam below her and brought her up for air. He faced her head down and slapped her back, driving the water from her lungs. She sputtered as he nestled her into the relative cool of the small lake. Jean dipped his face in and drank. Fu's eyes fluttered as she came back to the present. Drink, my lover, drink, good water. Jean said roughly, his hair matted to his head from the road dirt. Sue sipped at first, then drank more. They relaxed in the water. Jean held his hairy arm over her head to block the sun, her delicate porcelain features brightening from their trek under a harsh sun. They waded ashore, where a naked Jean built a small lean-to using the bag, its contents dumped on the ground. He returned to the lake with the flasks, filling them all, while drinking fully in quantities that only a werebear could hold. I don't mind, but where are your clothes? Fu finally asked. Once Jean's head was clear, he knew that he would have to backtrack a few miles to find where he'd changed form. 
the three-legged tracks through the fallen lands would be easy to follow. That way, Jean said, pointing. I get them and come back soon. He leaned down to kiss her, and she wrapped her arms around his neck and pulled herself to him. Don't leave me, she whispered. He nodded and lay down next to her, handing her a flask so she could keep drinking. Caressing her hair with a meaty hand, he didn't remember falling asleep. When they woke, it was early morning. Dawn's approach lightened the eastern sky. Jean and Fu drank and then bathed in the lake. They moved upstream to drink some more. Jean picked up Fu and carried her in his arms as he ran through the darkness on his way to recover his clothes, his wear-enhanced vision helping him see the way. It took less than 30 minutes to run the five miles to where his clothes had been abandoned. He dressed and bowed for Fu as if they were on parade. She clapped before he picked her up and ran back to their camp. Jean didn't see an elevation from which they could learn where they were, but it didn't matter. The sun rose in the east, which meant that the small river leading from the lake was heading south. They packed their stuff and headed out. There had been no fish, but there were tracks in the muddy shore. Jean thought they were from a deer, but they could have been a wild boar. He trusted their scent more than their tracks, but they were old. The first day of their new lives was spent hungry, but at least they had an unlimited supply of water. Jean didn't risk crossing the open wastelands again. He stayed near the river, following its meandering track. South. Always south. The third day, and Fu's ribs were growing more pronounced against her skin. Jean knew they had to find food. He was starving, but he knew that Fu would eat first. Terry Henry always ate last, and finally Jean understood why. Everyone needed somebody to take care of them. Terry's love was for all mankind, for the humanity he fought to save. He had taken on the responsibility of bringing back civilization. That meant sacrifice. That meant eating last. Jean was a werebear, a solitary creature who fought to live, not to take care of someone else. That was, until he met Fu. Sacrifice for others, even something so simple as eating last. It made sense. If one provided enough, then everyone ate well. If there wasn't enough, then the leader failed. There wasn't enough. Jean was failing Fu, but she hadn't complained. She trudged along, smiling when Jean looked at her. When they found the tracks, Jean set up a camp and moved downwind so that his prey wouldn't smell him. He wanted to change into werebear form, but there was always a risk that the animal would take over. Once that happened, the human Jean would be gone forever. He couldn't leave Fu out there, so he stayed in human form and picked up two rocks to brain an unsuspecting animal. Jean counted on his unnatural strength to give him the edge. He tracked the animals, looking for where they found shelter. Roe deer, not much bigger than a dog, a small family. Survival of the fittest, Jean didn't hesitate. With one throw, he took out two of them, and the second rock nearly took the head off the third animal. He hurried into the glade, snapping their necks, frowning with the act. There wasn't enough for both of them, but Fu could eat well for a week. And so she would. Jean ate the minimum he could to maintain enough strength until he found a better source of food. Fu sensed the werebear's unhappiness as he cleaned and cooked the small animals. She ate in silence, knowing that she had to. Knowing that he had done what he had to for her. We will survive, my Jean, she finally said. I want you to know that I'm not cold anymore. Jean looked at her, and with tears in his eyes, he started to laugh. He stood and started to dance, Russian style, but without music. His arms crossed as he dipped and kicked his legs out, yelling, ha, with each movement. After two more weeks of traveling down the river, they stood on the shore of the Black Sea. Jean had speared fish and a great wild boar that sustained them. Fu found root vegetables and edible greens. 
It took both of them to sustain each other. Jean understood the harmony of their partnership. What he would do for her, she would do for him, and together, they were far stronger than they could ever be alone. Jean picked Fu up and swung her around in a circle. I already like it here, he told her in his heavy Russian accent. Karosha, ya toja, she replied in Russian. Good, and me too. And we have a second story this week. It is Recollections on Teaching Gene to Fight, once again from Craig Martell and narrated by Kate Rudd. Recollections on Teaching Gene to Fight. WWDE plus 31. In China, Jean almost died after a fight with a were-tiger. Since then, Terry had spent a great deal of time turning the wrestler into a fighter, helping him understand how best to use his strengths while limiting his weaknesses. As big as that melon is, you'd think there'd be goddamn brain in there, Terry yelled, spit flying from his face. Jean growled and snarled but didn't approach. In werebear form, he circled his opponent. Terry swung a small club with metal spikes to replicate the claws of a were-tiger. Terry drove the spikes into Jean's shoulder and raked the flesh unmercifully. Jean turned and swept a massive paw through the space where Terry Henry had been. Terry danced out of the werebear's reach. Jean attacked again, pulling up short and beginning a dance of his own. Standing on his two back feet, he weaved and bounced. Jean worked his way back and forth until Terry was cornered. Then the werebear attacked. Terry counted on his strength to jump over Jean and free himself, but the werebear was too quick. A claw swung and embedded itself in Terry's leg, stopping him mid-leap. Jean dragged Terry to his chest, turning the human away from him to expose his neck. Stop, Char bellowed. Jean opened his jaws wide. Char leapt into the air, and with the full force of her werewolf strength, she punched Jean in the side of his furry werebear head. He instantly dropped Terry and staggered to the side, changing into human form as he fell over. Terry stumbled, wincing at the damage to his leg. Char gave him a drink of water, and together they watched Jean struggle to his feet. What happened? I thought I won, he exclaimed. You did win, my large friend. You are getting better with each new day. Terry didn't give false compliments. He meant what he said. Next up, about with a real were-tiger. Terry turned to Aaron, who looked exasperated. Yes, you. Come on, Terry, he's getting it, Aaron whined. Change now, Terry demanded. Aaron didn't bother taking his clothes off. He changed into were-tiger form and easily slipped out of his clothes. The great cat screamed, showing its fangs. The were-tiger focused like a laser on the were-bear, then slowly laid down and started licking its paw. Terry slapped his forehead. They'd fought together, and Aaron and Jean were friends. Terry never knew what Aaron would do when he changed into were-form. In this case, the cat didn't seem inclined to fight. Terry stormed into the sand pit and grabbed Jean by his ears. The big man was naked, and there was nothing else that Terry was willing to put his hands on. Jean's face turned red, and Terry let go. Show him that a were-tiger cannot better you. Become the were-bear, my large friend, Terry said softly, encouragingly. Jean changed into the monstrous were-bear. He stood on his back legs and roared, then dropped to the ground, making the sand fly and the earth shake. Aaron jumped to his feet, snarling afresh. Jean charged. Aaron dashed out of the way, turning and attacking the werebear's flank, but Jean was ready. He dug in with his front paws and lashed out with a back leg, kicking aside the were-tiger's attack. Bear claws and tiger claws raked each other's legs before they separated. Aaron circled, limping slightly from his wound. 
Jean turned and shambled, but deliberately back and forth, trying to force Aaron into a corner. Shar ran to the side once she found that she was between the tiger and the corner that Jean was trying to force him into. Aaron bunched his legs beneath him, preparing for a mighty leap. Jean surged forward, then jumped sideways into the path of the leaping were-tiger. Jean swung a giant paw, connecting with Aaron and sending him flying into a wall. Jean tore the ground up as he headed for the rebounding were-tiger. Aaron heard him coming and leapt mightily straight up the wall. He kicked against the wall and sailed well over Jean's head. The were-tiger hit the ground and took off running. Jean stood as he turned, ready for the were-tiger's attack, but the only thing he saw was Aaron's tail as he disappeared into the nearest stand of trees. I'd say that tells you how well you were doing, Jean, Terry declared, as Shar nodded. Jean changed back into human form. He looked around and stated the obvious. Hungry like bear. And that is it for this week's edition of Ear Crush. For those of you who listen to audiobooks from LMBPN, we've had a big week. Uh, three, three audio releases this week. The first was Rebirth, book five in the Ascension Myth series from L.D. Clark and Michael Anderley, narrated by Pearl Hewitt. Second release is Eye for an Eye, uh, book three in the Unbelievable Mr. Brownstone series that's narrated by Kate Rudd, who you've just been listening to. Uh, this is a fun series. If you haven't gotten started with the Unbelievable Mr. Brownstone series, I really, I really recommend that you'll enjoy that. And the big release of the week is, of course, Cretharian Gambit, book number 19, A Head Full by Michael Anderley and narrated by Emily Beresford. So happy listening, and we will be back in your ear again next Friday.